what's up YouTube today we're going to do a balance manifesto breakdown now for the balance manifesto I'm probably going to split it up into three different videos in this first video you'll be watching I'm going to go over the balance manifesto breakdown so pretty much just giving you a quick hit of what actually got buffed what actually got nerfed and my quick thoughts on what will actually change and if anything will actually change with these buffs and nerfs and then in the next video I'm going to do things they should have nerfed because there were a few things that got left out that should definitely have been changed. And then next video, I'm going to do the best 3.17 league starters as of now, after seeing all of the balance manifesto changes. Because I think at this time, we can pretty much know what's going to be pretty good, barring the patch notes or the reveal on Friday, showcasing a lot of different new skills. But with what we have now, and it wasn't really that many nerfs overall. We should have a pretty good idea of what we should be playing going into 3.17. Now let's get underway because right away you can see on this title page there is a bow shooting at something, right? So what does this mean? It's a bunch of self-cast and bow buffs. But let's begin. So first off, we have a bunch of self-cast buffs. Now as many people know, self-cast doesn't really exist as a playstyle in PoE currently. The only time self-cast ever existed in PoE was as Aura Stacker. And the reason why Aura Stackers used to be strong was because they had a lot of cast speed from the Necromancer Ascendancy that gave you cast speed based on your Aura effect and number of Auras you had. And they were also extremely tanky of regen and 90% all res and nearly capped out physical damage reduction. So now, hip-based spellcasting sucks because you have no defenses, you have no real mobility, and you also don't really cast that fast because you are missing pretty much 100% cast speed. So their solution is to buff almost all spells by around 45% more damage at gem level 20. This means that you will be able to see that most of the spells have gotten an insane amount of damage buff, and they also had a huge effectiveness of added damage buff. Now, in order to counteract people just putting all of these spells on traps, mines, or totems, or cast on crit, they decided to nerf all of the support gems for traps, mines, totems, and cast on crit by a significant margin to make it so that it gets cancelled out. On Reddit, there's actually a spreadsheet that shows the balancing and what actually happens after you take into account all of these nerfs and buffs. And they were pretty good about it. Overall, I would say that most of the gems are significantly buffed for spells self-cast, but they weren't really nerfed or buffed for cast on crit for totems or mines or traps. Now something to keep in mind is they actually nerfed the item soul mantles, so spell totems won't be as good as you think. And next up, they actually nerfed Unleash because Unleash doesn't really fit the self-cast archetype. And if they buffed all of the spells by a certain amount, then everyone's just gonna play Unleash instead, right? And they also nerfed Ignite by 28%, so that the not all spells would just become ignite based right so people wouldn't just play ignite arc because it got a 40 percent damage buff and no ignite nerf so overall they're pretty much trying to make it so that the buff and nerfs get canceled out for every single archetype besides self-cast now for the threshold jewels they did something pretty interesting with the threshold jewels what they decided to do with the threshold jewels was they pretty much removed all of the threshold jewels that gave anything extra straight up in terms of damage. Like I know first snow got removed because it gave extra projectiles. So they want threshold jewels to have something unique to it that changes the way the skill works rather than giving it damage or a downside. So right now, EK threshold jewel exists. It gives more projectiles. So the more projectile part is removed and now it just shoots it around in a circle. The spark is the same way. The spark used to give two additional projectiles and reduce the spark duration by 15% or so. Now it just makes sparks shoot around in a circle. So that's what they want to do with threshold jewels. They want to push it towards just uh, changing mechanically how the skill will function. Now something to note is that this means that a lot of builds might be nerfed. I do know first snow getting nerfed in terms of like, I think freeze pulse is actually a uh, kind of hard to make up for. Now, another way they were gonna buff um, self cast was that they were gonna buff cast speed modifiers on weapons slash jewelry. So that means on weapons and jewelry, you'll pretty much find that the cast speed is much, much higher. 
Currently, the highest Caspi modifier on a ring is like 7%, and I think they buffed it up to 15%. And for wands, I think they used to be like 23%, and now I think they might even go up to 30%. So this is kind of substantial if you add it up all together, and once you have mirror tier gear on every single slot, you're probably going to be looking at 60 to 70% increased cast speed, which is very, very significant. Now, they did do some ignite compensation changes for non-spells. So if you're using like explosive traps or something, or if you use the explosive arrow or burning arrow, they did buff the base damage for some of these things to compensate for it. Now, this is actually a huge buff to explosive arrow because they changed it so that each fuse on explosive arrow now gives 5% more ailment damage. So before it was only the hit damage. So what this means is that Explosive Arrow is going to be the most meta league starter, almost guaranteed at this point. So Explosive Arrow Ballista Totem, which was already strong before, now pretty much received a 44% buff after taking into account the 100% ailment damage and then the 28% less ignite damage. So be ready to see a lot of Explosive Arrow builds. So what is this verdict on self-cast? The verdict on self-cast is that this is much better for beginners who are starting out. So like a lot of people, when they start out, they pretty much choose a self-cast spell and then just play with it, right? You get EK, you play with it. You get Spark, you play with it. You get Freeze Pulse, you play with it. Because most people don't want to be forced to use Storm Blast Mine slash Orb Storms to level or they don't really know how to do it. So this is a huge buff for beginners and also allows these self-cast builds to be played a lot longer before you start feeling that you're either getting one-shotted or you're just not dealing enough damage. This actually ends up being a slight nerf to cost Breeze Cast on crit because they increased the internal cooldown from 0.15 to 0.25. So this is very slight as the 6 link chest is probably the most of your damage anyhow. But this is kind of a double nerf in that the cast on crit gem got nerfed and then also the item got nerfed. So this is kind of unfortunate. And this allows self-cast to get damage without having to build glass cannon. Right now self-cast almost does enough damage but this damage is only... Doable if you sacrifice everything and get damage. You get two void batteries, you get badge of the brotherhood, you stack power charges, you pretty much get no defenses whatsoever. You run all damage ores with zealotry and hatred. So you're just left with no grace and determination. Now, self cast will be better end game, but it will still be mediocre compared to other options because of new cast no new cast speed multiplier. Like getting increased cast speed is really nice and this is mainly a thing that you get when you have really really good gear overall. But the fact of the matter is with no new cast speed more multiplier it's still going to feel really really slow. But unless you have really really extreme gear levels. Now mechanically self cast is bad in that it will lag behind until gear is good enough to insta kill bosses. You ever watch anyone do self cast on feared? If they're not insta killing the bosses on feared they're pretty much running around the map with their head cut off, trying to get in a window of time to cast. That's why skills like Stormbrand, why Ballista Totems are so strong, because it allows you to run around and still do damage. Like if you're playing self-cast, you're pretty much kind of like a melee character without the defenses. And you're trying to fit in this window of time that you could actually cast your spell that's not even that fast because you don't have that much cast speed. So hopefully it can fix the issue. I do think that self-cast will be fine once you reach a threshold where you have so much damage that you can just instantly kill everything. But before that, it won't be as great. But early game, it will be absolutely amazing just to have that amount of damage being buffed. Now we move on to hit base bow buff. So right now, not many people play bows. And bows is pretty much only an end game option once you get mage blood. Because the defenses of the build are so bad, right? So if we go up Healy Ninja, we can clearly see what the overarching problem is with Bow. So if you go look at Tornado Shot, and you go sorted by the highest damage, every single one of these people do not have that much life. Besides maybe the Juggernaut, every single person is around 4k. This guy is probably around 4.9k, which is the best that I've seen. But all of these builds require insane, insane investment. So they pretty much want to help beginners play Bow's without feeling that you're going to be glass cannon or doing no damage. So what they did to fix this was they made the local added elemental damage modifiers and bow base types buff. Uh, this is up to almost 50%. So that means you can probably see the flat fizz on spine bow buffed and you can see all of the flat added damage on bows buffed. So you'll have higher flat fizz, you'll have higher flat Ellie. And this is pretty good, right? So if you see this bow right here, you can see the 46 to 84 fizz damage might even go up a little bit. 
And plus one arrow is now a core modifier for quivers. That means when you play early game, you don't need to wait until you get an influence quiver to get plus one arrow. And this should help out a lot for both clear and single target damage in terms of barrage. Now they also added a bunch of modifiers on quivers, an extra tier for flat fizz, accuracy, and attack speed. So I think the quiver probably goes like 16 or 17% now. They also add a new quiver base type with higher flat fizz, higher accuracy, higher attack speed, higher weapon elemental damage. So what this means is that Doom Fledge could actually be pretty strong because Doom Fledge is already a pretty good bow. So if you give it all of that extra flat fizz from the quiver base, and the quiver base does have a lot of flat fizz, then it could be extremely, extremely strong. And they also kind of did a mastery rework for bows. They actually did the stealth nerf, and this nerf actually affects toxic rain a lot. They replaced the bow mastery that gives movement speed while phasing and phasing on kill. But they gave us a new bow mastery that gives you plus 100 accuracy per green socket on bow. So this could pretty much solve your accuracy issues completely, and this could be equal to like one or two items worth of accuracy, right? So overall, they identified a lot of the problems. They actually have another bow mastery that gives increased duration of Mirage Archers. So this could actually end up being pretty good. I do think a lot of people do like playing bow builds. I do think that bows will still be extremely, extremely end game, and that you will really need a Mage Blood still to be able to play the build and have really acceptable defenses, right? So tying in line with the bow nerfs or bow buffs is also added damage nerfs. Now, they do believe that added damage support gems are too strong. So added cold, added lightning, added chaos damage, and fire have all been nerfed. Oh, wait, there's no added fire because added fire is a percent base of your fizz. So this is compensated with higher local added fire, cold, lightning, physical, and chaos damage on weapons. So this pretty much goes hand in hand with these uh, bow buffs. So what they've done that's really big, and they pretty much just increased all of the mods by a certain percentage. But what they've done that's really big that actually helps you out if you're actually playing like Berserker Lightning Strike or Raider Lightning Strike or any elemental build early on is that they made the tier 2 local added fire, cold, and lightning damage increase by roughly 26%. And tier 3 has been increased by roughly 40%. So this means that early game, when you're trying to get a weapon or Ellie weapon or Ellie claw, the weapon will be a lot, lot better on average. So even with the support gem nerf of added cold, most people will be coming out extremely, extremely far ahead until they get a double T1 weapon, right? So this is actually pretty big and it's kind of disguised as a nerf. So next up, we have something that is pretty bad for Venom Gyre technically, but not really bad once you think about it and try to find solutions for it. So this nerf is actually something that a lot of people say is a long time coming and it is a Hydra Spear nerf. So right now, a lot of builds are able to utilize Hydra Spear to pretty much double their damage effectively. And now, Hydra Spear works in that it's another thing that allows you to hit with a projectile and it can chain and it can fork. And it also allows you to use it with strike skills so that you can hit the Hydra Spear and get both the benefit of the melee hit and the projectile hit. So the, the way to change Hydra Spear is it now has a one second cooldown before it can be hit again. And boy, is this a game changer for a lot of builds. So they nerfed a lot of strike skill single target that was already horrendous before. So you have frost blades now. In frost blades, there's literally no way to hit with both the projectile and the blades, the projectile component. And it also nerfs flicker strike. Flicker strike single target is literally cut in half because you can no longer hit the hydra spear and have melee splash splash off the hydra spear. So what this means is that it's also a huge single target damage nerf for Eric Colley's fangs. And for anyone using Divergent Melee Splash already, it's pretty much going to be a half damage on your single target. So this does mean that Eric Colley's Fane will be a lot, lot worse for Simulacrum farming and early game damage until you maybe get a Squire. This also is a pretty big nerf to Eye of Winter, Stormbrand, and other spells reliant on Hydra Spear for chains. And it also affects like Wanders who have to use Hydra Spear for trying to use Vengeance Cascade. And this is mainly for budget Wanders. Now, the reason why I didn't think that they would nerf Hydra Spear is because it nerfed so many different things, right? Because I just listed out a bunch of things that got nerfed. And it's kind of like a huge cascade of effects that happened. Now, the nice part about all of this is they actually forgot to nerf Tornado. Now, Tornado behaves the same way. Tornado has this initial duration 
of like 1.5 seconds that it can get hit by projectiles and it can get hit by up to 20 projectiles. Now, Tornado has no internal cooldown, so you can pretty much just keep casting it and refreshing it so that you can hit it with 20 more projectiles again. So what this means is that Tornado is now OP if you use it with Spell Slayer, use it with Asnaf's Chant, and you use it with Cast on Crit. So you could just keep casting Tornado and you can still keep benefiting from hitting it with the projectiles initially for the initial duration. So overall, I think that this is a good thing maybe because Tornado not being nerfed means that builds that really want to kind of invest into being able to cast something that lets you attack with it again, attack another target with a Spell Slayer, Asinas, or Cast on Crit, it's still an investment. You still have to use an aura reservation for Spell Slayer. You still have to use a unique helmet for Asinaps. And you pretty much have to dedicate a lot more gem links for Cast on Crit because you need two more gem sockets. What this means is that you won't just be able to cast one Hydra Spear. You'll be done for eight seconds. You have to reliably keep it up. And also, Tornado moves around a lot, so it actually screws over a lot of positioning issues. Now, the mark changes are pretty big in general. So right now, most people are able to cast marks purely with the ring. Like you have Assassin's Mark Ring, you have Warlord's Mark Ring. So now pretty much marks are now permanent on application. So you can pretty much just cast the mark once and then you'll never have to cast it again. And they also added a support gem that allows attacks to trigger marks on hitting rare and unique targets. So you pretty much just link the support gem to the uh, mark on your gear and then you don't even need to link it to the attack. And then every single time you attack, you will trigger the mark on hitting rare or uniques. So this is kind of interesting. Maybe spellcasters can proc the mark with shield charge or whirling blades. And this is a pretty big buff to sniper's mark. Before, sniper's mark could never really be casted. And it always had to be self-casted because it is just so strong. So this means that now you pretty much have sniper's mark on hit if you link sniper's mark to the new support gem. Now the influence modifiers for trigger mark when you hit a rare or unique enemy has pretty much been removed from the modifier pool. So that means if you want like assassin's mark, you will pretty much have to use two extra gem sockets on most builds. Now this is a pretty big problem because a lot of builds are pretty capped out on how many gem sockets they actually have. So having this change pretty much will put a huge pressure on your gem sockets and might even lead to the need for unset rings. Now next we have a little bit of a change with fortify. So if you ever do a simulacrum, now this is a buff to Lightning Strike and anyone who pretty much runs Fortify in melee content is simulacrum. So Fortify now will re ignore target's damage reduction. So in simulacrum delve, targets have a lot of damage reduction. So you're never able to really get to 20 Fortify stacks at all. So now you pretty much have an extra like 15% damage reduction while doing simulacrum for a lot of builds that you actually use Fortify. So now let's move into the juicy part, which is how they're going to change the OP stuff like DDD, Seismic Trap, Toxic Rain, and March of the Legion. So here we have the skill balance changes, and boy oh boy, they messed up. I do not really know what they were doing, but they actually fundamentally do not understand why DDD is strong in its current state, or they just don't care and just want DDD to be the most played skill in solo self found hardcore. So what this means is that DD is actually buffed because DD now has Desecrate now has a 50% chance to spawn highest life Spectre Corpse per Corpse spawn. So that means now you don't need a Spectre pool, right? So that means that you could theoretically use one Spectre as a hardest, uh, a host chieftain or a Carnage chieftain and get Frenzy and Power Charges for free. And what this also means is that DD is now buffed in its worst fights. So when on Shaper, you have a bunch of mobs in the pool. But now, no matter what, every time you desecrate, every single corpse you have will have a 15% chance to be the highest slice specter. So that means DD is extremely better in its worst case scenario, which is shaper fights and areas where it has a lot of mob dilution in its pool. Now, it does get nerfed in its best case scenario, which could be like synthesis maps. But a lot of people thought it was going to be 15% chance per desecrate cast. But Zizzerin actually confirmed that that is 15% chance per corpse, not per cast. So that means on average, on Desecrate, you will get 0.9 corpses or Spectre Corpse. And if you link it to Spellcast Day, I think you actually get 1.8 Spectre Corpses per cast. 
Now, this is actually just a buff because it actually helps smooth out DD's damage, which is already so extremely high that it doesn't really matter. Now, you might be wondering, what about the 28% Ignite nerf? I mean, the 28% Ignite nerf does affect it, but let's be real. DD is so extremely strong right now that 28% doesn't even come close to cutting it. And this is actually a huge buff to DD's consistency. It will make it feel a lot smoother to play in its worst case scenario. So the only hope that we might have is that corpse life was kind of changed so that the highest life corpses no longer have so much life, like 8 to 900% life. And that's pretty much the last hope that we could hope for. Now, if you're playing SSF Hardcore or you're going to be participating in the boss kill race in Hardcore, what this means is that you'll probably be playing DD. So get practicing, get playing the Necromancer because DD is going to be life, DD is going to be love. So next up, we have Seismic Trap AoE Scaling Nerf to reduce number of overlaps. So GGG actually took it pretty nice this time. Eventually, initially, I thought they were going to do the triple GGG action where they nerf it in three ways. So they would nerf Seismic Trap damage, AoE, and duration, but they decided to only nerf the AoE. Now, the nice part about this is that Seismic Trap will probably still be strong because Lighty said that even with no overlap, Seismic Trap did enough damage to kill everything in the game. Now, Exsanguine is the other part of Seismic Trap, and it actually got substantially nerfed because of the nerfs to Trap Gem, Cluster Gem, or Cluster Trap Gem. So you're pretty much looking at Exsanguine doing roughly like 40% of its damage on Poison Exsanguine, so that's actually a pretty big, what's it called, nerf. So Seismic Trap will still be viable though, for sure. Now, Toxic Rain roughly received a 17% nerf. They kind of justify this nerf by saying you're going to get a lot, a little bit of power back on Quivers, but as in classic GGG fashion, Toxic Rain is pretty much just going to get a roughly 17% damage nerf, and it's going to be a lot worse to play, as the single target is already not out of this world until you get all influence gear. So now we get to the best change of them all, and this is definitely the best one. March of the Legion has been destroyed. Is no longer an item. Well, it's still an item. But before March of the Legion, you could reserve up to four auras temporarily on your mana, but now you're only able to do it with one. So, what this means is that they added a Blessing Support Gem now that March of the Legion is gone. And what Blessing Support Gem does is it allows you to cast the aura and it gives you a, a temporary aura buff, but you can only use it with one aura max. So this actually benefits Archmage characters, so it allows you to probably run two auras with Essence Worm and the Blessing Support Gem. It also helps out Blood Magic characters so that you can actually end up running one aura. So it actually adds a lot more build diversity in the game. So maybe one day when Archmage gets buffed, we'll be seeing Archmage with multiple auras again. They also changed Supreme Ego, so it's no longer limited to one aura and now its effectiveness gets scaled some other way based on how much mana the aura reserves. So pretty much it seems like they got sick and tired of looking at POE Ninja and seeing people of 100 billion damage, abusing March of the Legion, just making a complete mockery out of their game, right? This guy is using March of the Legion, he's using Supreme Ego, and it's just a complete sham. So now we have to nerf to immunity builds, and this is pretty big. It's not really pretty big, but immunity builds are terrible. They trivialize the game, and then they lower the profit margin of Simulacrum because people who are using like a 20x gear set is literally getting six rewards on every single wave while completely trivializing Simulacrum. So what it did was Shade Form now pauses cooldown while skill is active. So before people were stacking Self Curse with Temp Chains, they're stacking cooldown recovery and they pretty much made this buff Shade Form which is granted by Shroud of the Lightless and Replica Eternity Shroud. So Shade Form used to have you were able to lower the cooldown so that the skill would pretty much never be off. So you would pretty much have 100% physical damage immunity. Now Strength of Blood is the other immunity build that came out, which is your leech or life recovery rate gets scaled relative to your damage reduction. So if you got like 200% life recovery rate or something like that, you would get immunity to damage. So that's no longer in the game. Now, this is really good because immunity builds are super lame and they pretty much trivial or make a lot of content that would be profitable to be farmed because it is difficult 
it makes the content a lot less profitable. And you can see that it's simulacrum prices and what happened once the bone shattered juggernaut with the shade form came out. Now let's go over what are my final thoughts of these patch notes or balance manifesto. Oh wait, before I did the final thoughts, I forgot they changed some more unique items. Dancing Dervish, which is some random like minion unique. So before you weren't able to get Rampage, but now you can get Rampage whenever you hit the boss. So you can keep up Rampage on boss fights. Purify, which is some unique chest. Now it gives you plus two to four maximum fortification when placing banner. Instead of giving you plus the ratio of Fortify, they said they did this change because it caused some technical issue. And they also made it so that Void Fletcher will most likely be nerfed, so it no longer outclasses every rare quiver. The numbers aren't... They are not too sure about the numbers right now, but basically they want to take a look at Void Fletcher because it might be too strong. Now, final thoughts. What do I think here about this patch? Or Balance Manifesto? First of all, Horrible DD nerf. I do not know what they were doing with Detonate Dead. A lot of hardcore players are going to hate the change. But don't hate the change. Hate the developer or hate the game. Because, boy oh boy, there's going to be a very high percentage chance of DD. I'm pretty sure that DD might even be banned in the gauntlet. It is that bad. But on the bright side, defenses were not nerfed, which is amazing. It would be really sad for GGG to give us all of these defensive options and building defense. And then just take it away and nerf it, right? So nothing has changed about defenses, nothing about spell suppression, no determination change, no grace change. And no Nightblade nerf is pretty big. And this also goes around with no alternate ailment nerf. Uh, this is something that's pretty good for me because most of my builds all abuse Nightblade. They all abuse Secrets of Suffering. And I don't know if they might sneak this in in the patch notes, but hopefully not. Because Nightblade is actually pretty OP. Now a lot of people ask me how OP Nightblade is. It's pretty OP. Now no flash charge gain on hit nerf. And this is actually pretty surprising. Because I thought this would be a no brainer. They could just add like a 0.2 second internal cooldown. But basically that means that Pathfinder defense will have life gain. Like 30% life gain when every time you get hit will still be a thing. That means hiltless builds will still be a thing. That means people pretty much having a pseudo mage blood will still be a thing. So this is actually a pretty good, uh, I think this is a pretty good for everybody involved in that you just have your flask up a lot more and you won't really need to worry about pressing your flask as much, which is a very good thing for most players. Now overall, this is a huge buff to beginner players as a large chunk of them do play self-cast spells and bow. When you ever ask a beginner player, what do you want to play when you grow up? Everyone answers, I want to be Robin Hood. I want to shoot people with my bow. I want to cast spells. I want to be a wizard like Harry Potter. So yeah, this is a huge buff to beginner players. They will see that they're actually able to do like probably 50% more damage early game. So they will be able to cruise through the axe. They'll love playing the game. Player retention will be better than ever. And trade will be fixed. And they will everyone will sing the virtues of PoE, right? Overall, my rating, 23.4523 out of 100 for SSF hardcore players because they're all forced to play DD. And 100 out of 100 for new players. And uh, yeah, that's my rating overall. Overall balance manifesto, pretty good. Didn't nerf a lot of things that I thought would be nerfed, but that's good because no Nightblade nerf and no Secrets of Suffering nerf. What will I be playing? Probably Berserker Lightning Strike into Venom Gyre. I will make a video. Next video is about what should have been nerfed and then the best 3.17 League starters after the balance manifesto. Thanks for watching, everyone. I hope you find more Mirrors, Exalts, and Mage Bloods than me. And see you next time. Bye.